the best response you can have to a payoff in a thriller is someone goes, oh, right, I forgot, of course, I should have played this. Fun Story offers a look inside the creative process from today's leading writers, creators, and filmmakers. All of our content is recorded live at Austin Film Festival and at our year-round events. To view previous episodes, visit OnStory.tv. OnStory is brought to you in part by the Alice Kleberg Reynolds Foundation, a Texas family providing innovative funding since 1979. From Austin Film Festival, this is On Story, a look inside the creative process from today's leading writers, creators, and filmmakers. This week's On Story, The Good Place and Parks and Recreation writer-producer Megan Amram. To me, the most fulfilling type of thing that I've worked on are these 30-minute shows where you can really get to know the characters. Mm -hmm. And for me personally, I always feel like comedy is more impactful when you when you really like have spent a lot of time with the characters that you're watching in this episode the good place and parks and recreation writer producer megan amram discusses developing characters audiences care about the emotion behind the humor and her emmy nominated web series an emmy for megan Tell me a little bit about uh, the genesis of an Emmy I also for was Megan. Like, if you don't, if you haven't heard of this thing I'm doing, it's going to make literally no sense, and I apologize in advance. <laughs> but I'm primarily a television writer, and like three years ago, the uh, Television Academy announced a new category for the Emmys, which was short form comedy or drama series and actress in a short form comedy or drama series, and I was like. What? There can't be that many people applying for that. So I made a web series that fulfilled the minimum requirements, which is six episodes, at least two minutes long, which was a rule change because of me, right. which I'm happy to go into more detail about. It is the most impressive thing I've ever done. Yeah. Um, six episodes, you have to be in like all of them. Yeah. And uh, it, I did force myself to get nominated for Emmys for this um, two years in a row. Right, it worked. It, did, it worked, sort of. I yeah. didn't win, which of course is the ultimate goal. Right. But, um, yeah. But maybe season three. I now feel like I have to do it forever, right. which <laughs> is a problem. If you followed my social media, um, I have a real problem with uh, committing to bits yeah. to the detriment of my health. Action. Hi, my name is Megan Amram, but a fictionalized version of myself for this web series. I was watching the Emmys last year, and there was a category called Outstanding Actress in a Short Form Comedy or Drama Series. And I thought to myself, wow, I could win that. It's, it's kind of impossible to tell your story without talking about your Twitter. Uh, you were one of the first sort of superstars, if I may say so. Thank you. And um, talk a little bit about that. I mean, that was a, a comedy outlet, I it's, imagine, a great practice. I started, after I graduated college, one of my friends, who is now a writer, um, started using Twitter to like practice writing jokes basically, or to in essentially have open mic nights and like do jokes for your friends. And I had not realized that that was a use of it. Yeah. And started doing the same thing. So truly I just copied him. Um, and it was a way, and this again, I had heard from other people that they were like, if you want to be a writer, you should write every day. Um, and so, partially because I've always like loved the game of writing short jokes. I started doing this on Twitter like 10 years ago at this point. And um, 
amassed a following just because it was like the right time when everyone started using Twitter to make jokes. Yeah. Like truly, it was, it, it feels like a different era of social media yeah. <laughs> when people are just being silly and like making friends. And when I first moved to LA, it's like I met a bunch of my friends who are still my friends because we liked each other's jokes, which seems really creepy, but you can kind of tell people's sensibilities yeah. based on what they talk about. Um, and for my first, not just my first few writing jobs, but even now when I meet with people, they often know me from my writing. They're on the outside. I think people who are writers from different generations would be like, why are you giving this all away for free? Right. And my thought at the time was like, okay, if you write enough for free, you'll amass a portfolio, which then someone will hopefully pay you to do this job for. And that's sort of how it worked out for me and a lot of different people. That's one of the things I, I really find fascinating and awesome about your career is you do have, you've written so many different kinds of comedy. I mean, you've done, you know, shorter fiction for New Yorker, you've done sketch shows, you've done award shows. I, I'm very grateful that I've been able yeah. to like bounce around from that because also you like working in different media, I think makes you better at the stuff you really want to be doing. Yeah. Um, but again, for me, it's like a, it's a way to continue working forward in the same career while also doing different stuff all the time and then you're not bored. Not that I'd be bored yeah. working on the same type of TV show, but right. um, no, sketch is really fun. I really like working, so after Culture I got hired on Parks and Rec with all of my like best buds and it, it was like, such a dream come true because that yeah. was like my favorite show before I got hired on it and to me the most fulfilling type of thing that I've worked on are these 30 minute shows where you can mm -hmm. really get to know the characters mm -hmm. and for me personally I always feel like comedy is more uh, impactful when you when you really like have spent a lot of time with the characters that you're watching. Walk me through uh, sort of writing an episode of Parks and how that... Yeah, so the creator of Parks and Rec, um, who also show ran that show and then also created and show ran another show I wrote for The Good Place, is named Mike Schur, who I cannot say enough amazing things about, to the extent that I'll seem creepy, but he's also a really good teacher, which just because you're a showrunner, it doesn't necessarily mean you know how to manage people or know right. how to like help greener writers figure out what's going on and that's a very delicate skill I think because a showrunner is the person usually who created the show is the head writer of the show but then also ends up being the manager of every single thing that happens in it and it takes a rare individual to be able to do all those things really well but I think he can so um, luckily at Parks and Rec there was a, a lot of different levels of writers. So there were people who'd been there forever mm -hmm. and there were new people who we all sort of learned the ropes at the same time. I started at Parks and Rec with this writer and comic, Joe Mandy, who's like a hilarious stand-up, and I've worked with him at like every show yeah. that I've worked on, which is great. Um, but we on that show would spend, you know, the first couple of months of the year sketching out what was going to happen over the whole season. Then we'd start actually writing episodes, and usually your showrunner would assign episodes based on the individual writer's talents or mm -hmm. interests. Mm -hmm. I wrote an episode. Um, the last season of Parks and Rec about William Henry Harrison because Mike was like, Megan's really weird and has a lot of very specific interests and information. And I was like, yeah, that sounds right. So I wrote about like a William Henry Harrison museum in Indiana, which um, was very interesting. If you guys want to hear more about that. William Henry Harrison is totally ridiculous. They can't even fill a small museum with real stuff about his life because he was so lame. The If He'd Worn a Coat Room explores how great America would have been if Harrison had worn a coat at his inauguration and not died. This room is called Other Things That Were Famous for One Month. Oh, and side note, admission to this museum costs $14.
And while you're here, why not visit the other famous Harrison's exhibit? One of my favorite things about being a TV writer uh, rather than a film writer is that by the time an episode gets to your television, I like the feeling that no one knows who wrote what joke, that it was so collaborative. Mm -hmm. That I mean, some writers keep a little closer track. Right. I'm just like, <laughs> we all wrote all of them. But um, I, I find that collaboration amazing. And also when you say half of a joke and someone else says the other half and then it like yeah. comes together and it's great. I was like, that's amazing. I never would yeah. have been able to think of that on my own. One of your favorite episodes uh, that you worked on there was Ron and Diane. Can oh yeah. Tell me a little bit about why that was such a, a favorite for you. Ron and Diane was very fun. It was, um, I, it was my first episode of okay. Parks and Rec that I wrote. And it also was like a Christmas, it was a crazy episode where Ron was at a like woodworking awards show, <laughs> which already is very silly in retrospect. And then it had um, Lucy Lawless playing his new girlfriend and Megan Mullally as his ex-wife, who is so funny. And uh, like Amy Poehler trying to run interference between them. And then he played saxophone at the end of yeah. it. And um, yeah, it was, it was like, to me, everything that made Parks and Rec great, which is like yes. really zany, but somehow you really cared about everything that was going on, yes. hopefully at, at the time. And just like everyone having a lot of fun. Welcome to the Indiana Fine Woodworking Awards, or as I like to call it, heaven. Run. Ah. Leslie, may I present Diane Lewis. Diane, this is Leslie Nope. Diane, wow, Ron has told me so much about you in that he has told me your name is Diane and you exist. Oh yeah, he's not a big share. I don't even know what his middle name is. Oh, it's Ulysses. I can see why he didn't tell me that. <laughs> Mary, mother of God. <laughs> That's Christian Bexfort. He's the modern master of the Shaker style. I'd never dreamed that I'd see him in the flesh. Go over and say hello. No, I'm sure he gets swamped with attention all the time. Ooh, if you ladies will excuse me, there is a jack plane that needs my attention. Go on, then. Then, then you go into the good place. I, I think made it clear that I will like follow Mike Schur to the ends yes. of the earth. And he, a few years ago, got in touch with me and was like, I have a new show. Do you want to come write for it, basically? And I was like, yes, and had no idea what the show yeah. was, had not heard anything, and was like, I don't care. I'm gonna go right for the show. And um, we were really close as a writer's room of Parks and Rec, and like half of the Parks and Rec writer's room also ended up coming to The Good Place yeah. for either the whole run or for a year at a time or whatever. So that was also amazing. It feels really wonderful to like be so comfortable around people. Because mm -hmm. I also find one of the hard things about sometimes going into a new show is even if you know people socially, you don't have that rapport where you feel comfortable uh, making jokes all the time. Right. And I don't even mean like topic, I just mean you have to feel so comfortable around people to like take the risks to say dumb things around them. Yeah. So anyway, Mike reached out to me, asked me if I wanted to write for the show, and then I went and met with him. I was like, so what's the show? And um, he pitched the basically entire first season, which if you've seen The Good Place, the premise is that Christian Bell wakes up and Ted Danson is sitting at a desk <laughs> and he's like, hey, what's up, you're dead. This is the great retelling of this show. <laughs> he's like, what's up, you're dead. Um, there's a good place and a bad place, but congrats, you went to the good place. And she's like, cool. And then it's revealed through the pilot that she was a really <laughs> person on earth and that there has been some sort of mistake and she has a friend who becomes a love interest named Chidi, who is a philosopher who helps her through this. And so it's a show where we talk a lot about philosophy and death. Yes. And I was like so excited about yeah. that. Like instantly, because if there's one thing I like more than philosophy, it's death. And uh, yeah, so that yeah. room, like the show, I think, maintains a lot of the same humor as Parks and Rec, which is, yes. I would describe as sort of like silly and absurd um, and generally family friendly, but it deals with a lot deeper subjects or subject matter 
um, which I found very fulfilling as a writer there. Maybe my biggest question, am I, I mean, is this, or? Well, it's not the heaven or hell idea that you were raised on, but generally speaking, in the afterlife, there's a good place and there's a bad place. You're in the good place. You're okay, Eleanor. You're in the good place. Well, that's good. Sure is. <laughs> okay, let's take a walk, shall we? Yeah, I mean, you guys sneak in a lot of uh, heavy philosophy stuff yeah. into a, a sitcom. You have a, a terrific episode on free will and determinism and... I would say the philosophy in The Good Place is like probably a 101 college level. Yeah. But I've, I've talked to so many people who watch the show with their children, which most of it is okay for kids. Right. There's one character who talks about masturbating all the time. And I was like, I guess you just don't. I guess that just. But um, it, uh, yeah, it, it warms my heart. Because I was like, this is a great way to sort of like start talking about these basic ethical questions. Yeah. Um, but yeah, we'd get in sort of fights in the Good Place writer's room because we all had very different opinions on the things, which I also find, not fights, but like discussions. Sure. I very much do not believe in free will, so. <laughs> you guys had to come to my panel. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, it's very interesting. What, what was it like writing for The Good Place with regard to it reinventing itself every season? Um, it's very fun and very hard. Yeah. It was like, we constantly would be like, why are we doing this? We could have just like coasted on season one stories for so much longer. But I, I, I think the best way to describe The Good Place Room is it was just really exciting because we were trying to do so many things at once. Um, that being said, there were days where we were just like sitting in silence and just like couldn't figure out things. I mean, Jeremy Barramy, the timeline thing, was a huge problem solver because we wanted to make it clear why someone could be alive on Earth and then also like dead in the afterlife sort of at the same time. <laughs> um, and one of our amazing writers, Josh Siegel, who also plays Glenn on the show, just like scribbled Jeremy Barramy, and it, he sort of just like had this epiphany, which was amazing. Um, and each writer at some point or, or another had epiphanies like that, and it's also very exciting when someone has a breakthrough. And it's like, oh, um, we should reboot everything all at once, or whatever. I clearly don't ever remember when things <laughs> happened. <laughs> Who's Jeremy Barramy? Okay. Things in the afterlife don't happen while things are happening here. Because while time on Earth moves in a straight line, one thing happens, then the next, then the next. Time in the afterlife moves in a Jeremy Barramy. What? In the afterlife, time doubles back and loops around and ends up looking something like Jeremy Barramy. This is the timeline in the afterlife happens to kind of look like the name Jeremy Barramy in cursive English, so that's what we call it. Sorry, I'm, my brain is melting. Yeah, Jeremy Barramy is an episode I wrote, but is also referring to the timeline of how time works in the afterlife, which looks like the cursive name Jeremy Barramy. And I think that is a very, that's a really interesting question because to me, things are just always a million times funnier when they are specific, because you're like, this could be real in a different world. But it, it's like that much more surprising when you give, it, rather than just saying like, the timeline in the afterlife is a bunch of loops, which right. is the same descriptive thing, where it's like, it's gonna be so much weirder if we give it like its lore. With The Good Place especially, which is basically a sci-fi show, we also wanted like sci-fi fans to like and respect our show, and part of that means making rules for yourself that are really, that you do not break. So I would say there was like half of us in the writer's room who were like fans of, of sci-fi shows and genre things, and we'd always be real sticklers for like, 
what are the rules of time? What, is the, what are the rules of how people can move in this space? Because we were like, someone on the internet is gonna care yes. about this. It's really all writing towards the internet, <laughs> which is not a good idea. But yeah, I, I don't know if there was one, we all just sort of had similar group think about it, but I would say um, I always really enjoy comedy when it's like highly specific. You mentioned, you talked a little bit about structure. What, what, what do you look for, or, or what, what makes a good structured episode? Or how important is structure in comedy? It, it's again, it's part of the reason I love sitcoms so much is because it affords you the opportunity to like, get people to expect something. So if you do yeah. six episodes in a row, that's generally the same type of story. I mean, still interesting, but like the characters, you're getting to know them, they're acting the way you're expecting them to. And then you do an episode like this where it's suddenly blowing up everything. That to me is so fun and you can only do it because you spent those other six episodes being normal. Right. So it's a really fun thing about um, also the fact that shows now, you're like we weren't exactly living in fear of being canceled. We knew the show was not gonna last that long because we, it doesn't really have a story to sustain like 20 seasons. So we kind of always knew we wanted it to be four seasons. It's also like TV is so inventive and good now. Mm -hmm. Like I watch so many shows and I'm like, that's the best show on TV. No, that's the best show yeah. on TV. They're all really good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they're all really different. And TV viewers, again, are like so knowledgeable about television mm -hmm. that I think we who are making it are like, oh, okay, so we can like hold our shows to a higher standard because the people watching them are on the same page and are willing to like have whole episodes about side characters or episodes that are genre-y or you know, are completely breaking the mold of the show or whatever it is. Like now is a great time for weird standalone episodes of TV. Yeah. One of the things that uh, The Good Place and uh, Silicon Valley even and, and, and Parks and Rec uh, have in common is, is uh, they're very funny and have some jokes that are really joke jokes, but they also have characters that you really care about and uh, that there's emotion behind a lot of the humor. Can you talk a little bit about a, a writing characters yeah. like that? I, I also have been thinking about this a lot because it's something that, again, I was, I think extremely grateful to learn from Mike Schur, but also it has just become a different conversation in comedy than it was 10 years ago. But if you, like when I was younger, I watched a bunch of like South Park and Family Guy mm -hmm. and stuff like that, which is fine if you're a child. <laughs> and um, I, no offense. I, I was like, <laughs> but, but it did, it, it's like uh, my view of what comedy was and also the type of people who did comedy was very different in a bad way than yeah. it ended up becoming. I also remember moving to LA and being like, okay, well, I'm gonna try to be a comedy writer and so everyone I know is gonna be mean. Right. Because one, growing up, a lot of the people I knew who were into comedy were kind of like mean about it and two, I just assumed that's like what writers' rooms were, where people like breaking each other's right. all the time. And then I have been so fortunate, but like the vast majority of rooms I've worked in have been the kindest people who all they want to do, and it has only ramped up more and more over the past few years, like all we want to do is put good out into the world. And I was like, especially, it's funny, we talk a lot about how Parks and Rec was really a show of the like Obama era because it was about a woman who like really was like raising herself up by her bootstraps and was in like local politics in Indiana and it sort of almost seemed to be an apolitical world where we never really talked about Leslie Nope's politics. It just mm -hmm. was like she was a good person. It was about her as a person. And the good place we talk about is a show that sort of is like for the Trump era, yeah. which is like there is a lot of darkness that people were not talking about in all contexts. And yeah. like our show is not about politics, but it's literally about like what makes a good person. And I think it's, it can be 
among like a million other things, you can like look at the world and be like, how, how are there so many bad people in the world? And then if you break that apart, it's like, well, what does that mean? How like should you give up hope on like the entirety of being alive? Or are there ways that people change? Or if there aren't, what does that say about your individual life? It's like all these very complicated things, but it is very much a reaction to us like dealing with our own <laughs> collective trauma, I guess. <laughs> You've been watching A Conversation with Megan Amram on On Story. On Story is part of a growing number of programs in Austin Film Festival's On Story project, including the On Story PBS series, now streaming online, the On Story radio program, the On Story podcast, and the On Story book series, available where books are sold. To find out more about On Story and Austin Film Festival, visit onstory.tv or austinfilmfestival.com. Want to see On Story Live? Join us at Austin Film Festival's annual Writers' Conference each October. Visit www.austinfilmfestival.com to find out more about badges and passes to attend the festival.